Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, kind of started trickling down to um, just a few people coming on. So we'll go ahead and get started right now. Welcome, everyone. Um, I just want to note really quickly, I know that a lot of folks that are that are on the Zoom tonight have been on our webinars before, but for folks that haven't, um, this is set up as a webinar, so we cannot see or hear anyone that's attending. Um, you can only see and hear us. And so, but we do want to hear from you and um, we do want to take questions. So if you would like to put in a question, please do so in the Q&A on your Zoom. Um, and if you are having technical difficulties or anything like that, if you would throw that into the chat, that'd be great. Um, I think that we'll probably wait till the end of Sarah's presentation to go ahead and take questions. So really briefly, um, this webinar is hosted by the Missouri River Bird Observatory. Our mission is the conservation of Missouri's birds and their habitats. And we do this um, through a number of different avenues via scientific research, bird population monitoring, uh, young people's education programs, adult and community outreach, and conservation policy advocacy. Um, if you want to learn any more about us, if you don't know us very well, please check out mrbo.org. So with no further ado, I'm super excited to introduce um, our state ornithologist for the state of Missouri, Sarah Kendrick. She's a good friend. She's an amazing biologist. Um, and I'm really excited to hear about the very recent reintroduction of the brown-headed nuthatch to our Missouri Ozarks. I believe this is the first public presentation on this, this topic, on this happening Close. that just occurred. Close. Close. Oh, Close. Second. But please take it away. Okay. Let me figure out my screen sharing here. One minute for me. It's just the fun realities of COVID life. Okay. I think you can see. I don't know. Oh my God, you're going to see it all in reverse. Sorry about that. Can everybody see the slides filling the screen? Yes, it looks good. Hey, hi everybody. I'm Sarah Kendrick. Uh, I'm your state ornithologist. I work for the Missouri Department of Conservation. Um, I'm really excited to talk about the brown head and hatch reintroduction. This is the second public presentation. The first one was to <clears throat> the commission uh, about a month ago, but this will be a little bit more fun because I have more time to talk about it and I can share a lot more pictures. And now we're finished for this year, for this year's effort. So it'll be more comprehensive. So you'll get a special version still. Um, thank you to Dana and Ethan and all the MRBO staff for hosting this guest scientist webinar. It's really um, an honor to be asked. And I encourage you all to check out um, their other webinars because they're great and they choose good topics and they're great educators and they're two of the hardest working people I've ever met. Okay, so enough of that. So. Uh, a little bit about myself. I always like to tell people I'm speaking to a little bit about myself. Um, I was born and raised in Missouri, mostly North Missouri. I have an, I have an English undergrad degree um, because I didn't know what the heck I wanted to do with my life, um, but I was told that I was okay at writing. So I picked that um, and then through doing uh, an internship after undergrad, I realized I wanted to work in the natural resource field. So I went back to school to take courses to get into a natural resource program. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I took ornithology and I was just completely smitten. Um, nothing had really resonated with me like that before. Um, and I loved it. I, um, this was a picture of me I took uh, in my very first field season finding nests of Acadian flycatchers and I was just in heaven. Um, and it really hasn't stopped feeling that way. So I got to work for with golden cheeked warblers in Texas. They're an endangered species. Um, we were finding their nests and monitoring them and banning them and that yeah, was lots of fun too. And then finally it seemed like a while later I got into a master's program with Dr. Frank Thompson who works for the Forest Service at Mizzou and he's an adjunct professor. So I studied eastern wood peewee breeding demography in savannah and woodland managed sites uh, and in forest uh, in the Missouri Ozarks. I also did winter point counts. So that's here's our huge peewee. So when people ask me what my favorite bird is, 
the net hatch may be a contender now, but I normally say kiwis. Sorry, kiwis. Um, these are just a few pictures that some people find interesting from my masters. Peewees hadn't had a really extensive nesting study done with them uh, prior to our study with hundreds of nests because their nests are really hard to access. So they're up to 60, 70 feet up in the canopy. So we use this telescoping um, antenna pole, <coughs> excuse me, with a, um, a security camera on the top. And then we had a little monitor down here at the bottom that uh, Melissa is holding and you can see my old camera reflected in the, in the front of the monitor and you can see three eggs. Here's the nest. You see three little peewee eggs. So we we're able to monitor uh, nest survival and things like that. So it was just lots of fun. Um, what else? I then worked for Mizzou crunching data and working to publish my master's thesis and then I finally after applying for like six or seven jobs I finally got my foot in the door with the conservation department as a wildlife program supervisor, which meant I was kind of an outreach and marketing coordinator for wildlife. And so I don't think I even would have gotten that full-time job if I hadn't gotten that English degree. So all that time that I felt I had wasted doing that actually came around and ended up helping me. And writing has honestly helped a ton in this field. So then in that position, even though it, I wasn't the ornithologist, they still let me grow and do bird things um, in a way. So. Um, I helped build the Great Missouri Birding Trail in the state to help people find the best places to go birding, greatmissourybirdingtrail.com. Um, and anyway, then a few years later, um, I got the opportunity to apply for the state ornithologist position because my predecessor, Brad Jacobs, retired. Um, and by some miracle, um, I got to be the ornithologist. So it's my dream job. I love it. Um, it provides a lot of cool opportunities. Um, last year, or the year before, I think it was the year before. I got to go to Costa Rica. We are involved in full annual cycle conservation, meaning for migratory birds, we have to uh, be worried about and support habitat conservation while birds are beyond our borders, um, up to eight months of the year for our migrants. So while I got to see lots of cool endemics and go down and help with the banning study, um, I got to see some of our migrants, which, what is this one? Everybody's saying female American red star. Yes, you're right. This is a red Iberio, and this is a Cerulean Warbler. We were down there in August, so it was really, really neat to band and see those birds coming through and using um, Costa Rica. Um, and then these are some of our project partners we worked with down there, um, local folks, and it was just a really neat opportunity. I've gotten help with saw wet banding um, with MRBO. They hold that every winter, and it's great. And then I've also gotten help Ohio State researchers um, to tag eastern whippoorwills in the Ozarks. So just lots of cool opportunities. I'm also married. This is my husband, Kip. And this is our four-year-old weirdo son, Abram. But I wouldn't have it any other way. I wonder where he gets it from. I just don't know. OK, so nut hatches. Um, I know you all came here to talk about nut hatches. Um, not my whole background. So tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of this project. Why would we bring brown-headed nut hatches back to Missouri? A little bit about their natural history uh, of the bird and then supporting analyses we had to do um, to really validate um, the, well, determine the feasibility of this project. Um, we really wanted to know about both the Arkansas source population that we would take birds from. It's the closest breeding populations to us. And then an analysis of our Missouri habitat, that availability and whether it's um, sustainable and healthy habitat that the birds could use if we brought them here. And then we finally made the determination just a year ago to go forward with this after all of those analyses. And I'll tell you about our progress and how it worked. So a little bit about the background. So this is not a new idea. People have been bouncing around the idea of bringing back brown-headed nuthatches for about a decade. I've been working on it for about two and a half years. Um, so it, it, it came with lots of partnerships. So uh, my thesis advisor, Frank Thompson, that I mentioned before, we were kicking around ideas after I got the ornithology position. And this came up because a lot of partners like Central Hardwoods Joint Venture and the Forest Service folks down in the Ozarks that had been conducting intensive pine woodland management have been talking about this topic. So we really started asking a lot of what if questions. So I reached out to Arkansas Game and Fish Commission because we would need their approval and permit to remove birds. I talked to the Fish and Wildlife Service. We would need permits from them. We talked to Tall Timbers Research Station. This is a small nonprofit in Florida that has conducted reintroductions before this to ask them all these what if questions. And we talked to the Forest Service staff in national forests here in Missouri and down in Arkansas and the University of Missouri. So 
before I go any farther, I really want to recognize um, <clears throat> my two major partners through probably the longest uh, stretch of this uh, effort is Frank Thompson. Again, he was my advisor, so it was fun to work with him on a project. Um, he works for the Forest Service Northern Research Station. And then Tom Bono, who's an awesome professor at Mizzou. So communication was key here, and we tried to keep all these different natural resource partners in the loop. So natural history of these birds. They are adorable. They're also a non-migratory or resident cooperative breeder, uh, meaning that normally second year males will hang out with the parents and help with the brood the following year. Um, the average percentage of these birds cooperative breeding is about 20 to 30 percent, but Rich Stanton, who is actually, I saw his name on the webinar, hi Rich, he was a uh, master's student with Frank Thompson and Dylan Kessler at the University of Missouri, and he actually studied nut hatches and tracked them in Arkansas in these potential source populations. He found about 80% of the birds of like 23 or four birds tagged uh, were cooperative breeders, so higher percentages in Arkansas for some reason. So they are a pine woodland obligate. They can't use pine forests, they need pine woodland, and I'll tell you what pine woodland is here in a few slides. Their range is mostly in the southeastern United States, um, but their northernmost latitudinal bound is Virginia and Maryland, and the western portion of the range goes up to Arkansas. So where we took birds from is about the northwest corner of their range. So they require, oh, sorry, they're common and widespread in their range where they occur. They're not included on regional or national conservation lists. They're a pretty common bird in pine woodland. Pine woodland. So they require that open understory that a woodland inherently has they need mature pines for foraging in the cones and they need pine snags. So snags are required for nesting because these birds excavate their own nesting cavities annually. Um, so this benefits other small cavity nesters if they can fit in the entrance hole, <laughs> including um, Carolina chickadees, bluebirds, titmice, um, other nut hatches, things like that. So it helps a broader group of cavity nesting species. They also will use nest boxes so where they are more common and more dense down in the southeastern states, they have nest box plans you can build for nut hatches. They'll also come to feeders um, and grab seeds like any other nut hatch. So these are some plans from the Georgia Department of Natural Resources, just as an example. So these birds, um, official uh, status in the state is extirpated. They occurred in the state. Uh, we have historic records from Woodruff in the early 1900s. Um, and shortleaf pine oak woodland systems once covered over 6 million acres in the Missouri Ozarks prior to massive logging and pretty much denuding of our Missouri Ozarks. So before that denuding of the Ozarks, much of the landscape was in shortleaf pine. And then when the forest regenerated after logging, it came back a lot oak and hickory. And so we lost a ton of that pine habitat that these birds depended on. So these birds could have left the state and been extirpated in the early 1900s. We're really just not sure when exactly that occurred, but that's when those last large pineries were removed. So these photos are very interesting. I love historic photos, but these are Ozark National Scenic Riverways photos um, of the Ozarks. Um, many of you have probably heard the stories of Grandin, the, one of the largest sawmills in the nation. Um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s is when that denuding occurred. They were one of the most active sawmills in the country. So these photos you see on these horse-drawn wagons and these big piles of logs, these are all pine logs. And then on the rightmost picture, you see all along the horizon there, this is a logging camp, you see all along the horizon, it's all pine. So it just kind of shows you how, uh, with these few pictures, how prevalent pine was um, in the Ozarks before it was removed. So the black outline on this map from the Forest Service, this map is from 2012. Um, the black outline is the historic range of shortleaf pine, and the red is its current range. This is just pine, it's not pine woodland, which requires that management, which I'll tell you about in a minute but it's pine. So there is pine on the landscape. So this idea has been kicked around for about a decade because of the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Project. It's a doozy of an acronym. It's a CFLRP. It's a nationwide forest service program that supports landscape scale management projects. So you apply to get this extra funding for these intensive management projects. So the project here in Missouri is the Pine Oak Woodland Restoration Project. So it's oak woodland as well, but it has a, a special focus on pine woodland. And the pine woodland has especially been ramped up in the Mark Twain National Forest is where they've really intensified management of this pine woodland. It's been a 10 year project from 2010 to 2020 and they're reapplying for another 10 year project. So 
um, this intense management will uh, continue if they get that funding, which we can make a very good case. So uh, the bird is a resident bird. They make very few long distance dispersals. We're talking like four or five kilometers is a pretty large dispersal for this bird. So natural, natural recolonization of our restored pine woodlands up here in Missouri, it's about a two, 300 mile stretch without you know, that contiguous pine woodland stairs or, that they can leapfrog along all the way across that expanse. Um, so natural recolonization is highly unlikely without that connecting pine woodland habitat along the way. They're just weak flyers. They don't make massive jumps like that, like some other species. <coughs> Pardon me. So I want to talk a little bit about woodland. These are a few pictures of that intense pine woodland management down there on the Mark Twain National Forest in the 11 Point Ranger District. It's just beautiful. It's very open. Um, but some of you may not know what a woodland is technically. So many people call any wooded area, even a forest, a woodland. And there is a difference between forest and woodland. So technically, forests have that closed canopy that doesn't really allow any sunlight to penetrate to the ground below. There are often several overlapping layers of trees, a midstory and an understory comprised of mostly shade tolerant shrubs and plants, uh, and an open ground layer, mostly leaf litter, just because other things can't grow, they don't get that sunlight. But woodlands, however, um, they're usually thinned, trees are removed, and it opens up that canopy. It's about 30 to 80% canopy cover, and that sparse midstory and canopy allows more sunlight to hit the woodland floor down here, and you can see it creates this rich vegetative layer of forbs, grasses, and shrubs. Um, so to create this woodland, you do tree thinning, and then prescribed fire is used every few years to maintain that open structure to prevent succession to forest, because that will occur if you don't continue this intense management. And that canopy is very open, so therefore that vegetative layer at bottom is very open, but if you don't burn this for like 10 or 15 years, it gets real choked out. Uh, and closed up and starts to succeed to forest. So you really have to burn every two, three, four years. Okay, <clears throat> so the brown-headed nuthatch has also been reintroduced um, in Florida to previously extirpated portions of the state. So in 1997, 42 nuthatches were translocated from Big Cypress National Preserve to Long Pine Key in the, in the Everglades. So they found a positive growth rate over 100 individuals in 2009 with distribution across the reintroduction area. So we weren't going in blind on this reintroduction. We know that in past reintroductions, um, they have done fairly well. So Tall Timbers Research Station, which I mentioned before that we reached out to them, um, they did a few small reintroductions in 2017 and 2019. Um, and they had about 80 to 90% reciting of translocated uh, birds and successful pairing and nesting. So it was very promising to hear those results and talk to those partners. Um, about how they thought it may go. So, but that's all fine and good. And anecdotally, we knew that there were birds in Arkansas and that they'd probably be fine if we removed them and that we have enough habitat in the state, but that's not good enough. We have to do habitat analyses to back that up with data. So to determine if a reintroduction was feasible, we asked, we had two main questions. Are Arkansas source populations stable enough to support removal of some birds for a host population? And does Missouri have suitable pine woodland habitat to support a population? So pretty straightforward. <clears throat> so before I go into um, the analyses that we conducted for this effort, I do want to point out the study that the Forest Service and Mizzou conducted. Um, they did an analysis of pine woodland management approaches in that CFLRP area in pretty much the Mark Twain National Forest, but also some MDC sites and state park sites. <clears throat> so they conducted an assessment of pine woodland management approaches, which means they looked at um, tree harvest, uh, tree thinning, and prescribed fire regimes 100 years into the future. So that's what some of these modeling things can do is they can, um, they can use um, analytical models to um, simulate different regimes of management way into the future and then predict how the habitat will respond based on uh, past observations how the habitat responds to that management. So with prescribed fire and harvest both, shortleaf pine becomes the most dominant tree group up to 100 years in the future um, with those management approaches with um, various climate scenarios. So in the face of climate change, 
um, shortleaf pine and pine woodland management with these management actions are favored into the future. So this provides a little bit of support for the habitat that these birds will have into the future with that management. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, I don't know where my, oh, one of my slides is gone. Okay, well, I'll just describe it. So, um, so when Tom conducted this analysis for us that analyzed, um, so there's a long-term bird monitoring data set from the Forest Service. It covers region eight, which is those southeastern states, and it covers all the national forests in that region eight. Um, and so all of those data are available. And what Tom did is he pulled out the Ozark St. Francis National Forest and the Washita National Forest, which were our two national forests in Arkansas of interest for removing birds. So they were able to pull um, data just from points from those national forests. And then therein, they pulled out just the brown-headed nuthatch data um, each of those points are standardized bird monitoring points over 25 years. It's a huge data set from 1992 to 2017. Um, so they're able to pull out all the points where brown-headed nuthatches were detected. So while they did standardized bird monitoring at those points, they also conducted vegetative data at the points as well. So for all the points where nuthatches were detected, they were able to also pull out the habitat characteristics at that point. So they're able to, in essence, look at the areas that nuthatches were choosing or, or what the habitat was like where nuthatches were detected. So from that habitat model, these are the variables related to abundance in just the Washita National Forest. So we see on the top left graph, the brown-headed nuthatch abundance increases with increased pine basal area. That makes sense to us. The more dense and larger the uh, pine trees are, there are more nuthatches found there. In the top right graph, um, abundances were also highest at points with intermediate canopy cover. We see that around here, right around the 60% mark. So again, they need that pretty open canopy. There also needs to be at least a couple snags around the point as well. So you see this line, see us, um, the abundance of nut hatches at these points kind of level out when you get to two snags per hectare. So they need at least a few snags per hectare. And they also, uh, their abundance was higher in about in a lower <laughs> mid-story canopy cover. So the more open um, that mid-story canopy cover was, there were more hatches. And so it's not shown here in a graph, but the overall amount of pine in the landscape, a 10 kilometer radius around the point, was also important as well for predicting whether or not hatches would be there or not. So from this, we're able to get an idea of kind of what nut hatches um, at points where they were detected, what the landscape was like. So kind of showing what their habitat preferences are. So Tom then applied that Arkansas National Forest model to remote sensing data in Missouri to, suit, to map the suitability of habitat across Missouri in those CFLRP sites. So from this regional perspective, it would seem that the CFLRP sites on the Mark Twain National Forest offer some suitable habitat. You can see that in the blue here on the map. However, the remote sensing data we used most likely predates much of the management that has occurred in the last five plus years. And so we probably aren't even capturing the most recent habitat improvements. So this is probably a modest model. But those CFLRP sites compared relatively well to the sites where nut hatches were detected in Arkansas. So now we'll shift a little bit of this analysis to the status of possible nut hatch source populations in northern Arkansas in these national forests. So again, he used this long-term 25-year data set uh, to look at those uh, brown headed nut hatch trends from those uh, national forests and just pulled out these this Ozark St. Francis National Forest and Washita National Forest. So since 1997, the nut hatch population on the Washita has seen a 6.5% increase in size annually, and most of that has been in the last decade. So unfortunately, we didn't have enough detections in the Ozark St. Francis National Forest um, to get a precise estimate of trends. But, we, but the number of detections are holding steady at least. We see that in this relatively straight line here. But you see this increase in the Washita. So we kind of anecdotally knew when talking to local managers down there that the Washita had a greater density of birds than the Ozark, but it's nice for this to be validated with uh, our findings. <coughs> Excuse me. So, <coughs> That was encouraging, finding that populations of nuthatches 
in northern Arkansas looked robust and they were growing over a fairly long period. But to estimate the actual population size to get a density, a number, like an estimate of the number of birds in the national forest, beyond that regional data, we had to collect samples at the time of year when the birds are most detectable um, and using protocols that allowed us to estimate density. So what that means is that all prior breeding season uh, bird surveys that are normally conducted are conducted in late May and June. Um, and so nut hatches are cavity nesters, which means most cavity nesters inherently nest a little bit earlier. And so the peak of nut hatch vocalizations may not be um, that time of year when most bird surveys are conducted, but maybe in March and April. So we decided to go down in March and count these birds. So we sampled birds mid-March to obtain densities. We took three days um, uh, with six folks um, from the department and Frank and Tom and Kara Jose with uh, American Bird Conservancy and Central Hardwoods Joint Venture. So we went down there, we conducted 12 routes, we sampled 362 points, um, we spaced the routes throughout the National Forest based on input from National Forest staff and using the original habitat data from that, those long-term long bird monitoring data to guide placement of the points. So we had pretty poor weather, honestly, for sampling, but we still managed to get enough detections to analyze the data. And the local staff um, at the Washita were just so amazing to work with and super helpful all the way through the reintroduction. So there's only a few more slides of models, don't worry. But you can see how this was a, <laughs> this was a complicated process, but it had to be done so that we could assess feasibility of the project. So we used the habitat model from those long-term national forest points to estimate density with our point counts in March of 2019. <clears throat> so on the left you see our original land bird model that we predicted and then with that validation model we were able to use um, the validation model on the right incorporated our counts that we conducted in March of 2019 that allowed us to estimate density and you can see how the validation model bumped our estimate of density across the landscape a little bit higher. Maybe it's because we were sampling in March uh, and the birds were more vocal, I'm just not sure. But you can see how the validation model bumped our estimates in the darker blue. Um, and the validated estimates of abundance on the Y or were about 25 to 50% above what the original data predicted. So that was positive. So from this map, then we could sum up the population size, what we were trying to get at with the density um, for brown headed nuthatch in the Washita National Forest. Um, for which they estimated over 20,000 birds. And so there's some uncertainty in that estimate, obviously. But even if we assume a 100 meter fixed radius on the land bird point counts, that long term national forest point counts um, from the original model, which we know is conservative, uh, that gives us an estimate of over 8,000 birds. So based on these two estimates, one lower and one higher, um, it's likely that this population in the Washita National Forest is at least 10,000 birds, somewhere in the middle. So we felt that that was enough, bir enough birds to remove 100. <laughs> so um, we had this kind of final partners meeting in August of 2019, where we pulled together all the project partners. We had Forest Service staff from the Washington National Forest, Ozark National Forest, Mark Twain National Forest, Mark Twain National Forest program staff, Northern Research Station staff, Arkansas Game and Fish, MDC, Central Hardwoods Joint Venture, and Mizzou. We brought all these people together um, we took a tour of like the habitat down in the Ozarks and we presented all this information and these analyses and we said, are we or aren't we? Should we move forward with this or not? Is this enough? Do you feel confident um, that we can move forward with this? And everybody said, yes, we had um, a big green light and it was really exciting. Okay, so I do want to cover a few <clears throat> different motivations for why we'd want to reintroduce brown headed nut hatches to the state. So it's a combination of these motivations. Um, first is habitat restoration. So clearly extensive shortleaf pine woodland restoration is occurring and it's ongoing. You've heard that um, so far. Climate models again support both the primary tree species in this habitat of pine woodland and the birds uh, density trends using habitat created in Missouri. Um, and nut hatches are just one piece of ecosystem restoration. It's a low cost, low risk piece of ecosystem restoration. So not only do we just want to bring back the shortleaf pine woodland uh, and its structure, um, but species that used to be here before it was removed. 
And again, our, our patches of pine woodland are just relatively far from where their existing breeding populations are. So it's just not as um, realistic that they would make that jump on their own. But Tom has also done other um, climate change models, uh, projecting management and things like that in the future that I can share with you if anyone is interested. And it also shows uh, brown-headed nuthatch densities just increasing. Um, that's assuming in the model that they find our habitat um, because we have enough and it would support a population. Also, they're extirpated. You know, the sole motivation is not only that we have records of this bird occurring in the state, that's not the sole reason to bring it back. But again, it's just one piece of that ecosystem restoration. And it's supported by its tree species and habitat with continued management that's projected to do well with a changing climate. Uh, also, Arkansas source populations are increasing. We've seen that. They're relatively stable um, and increasing in the Washita. And support for that pine woodland management um, and restoration is ongoing. So we felt very confident. So this reintroduction plan, what, is the, what are the juicy details everybody wants to know? So we plan on reintroducing 100 birds over two years in August and September of 2020 and 2021 from the Washita National Forest to Mark Twain National Forest, all birds um, to be uniquely color banded and half of the birds fitted with radio transmitters to monitor their survival uh, post-release. And then nest success will be monitored in the spring after both reintroduction efforts, both years. So we were really lucky to have, now is picture time. Are you excited? I'm excited. So um, Napadal Pathong is uh, one of the most amazing assets that the conservation department has. He's a photographer. He's an amazing, amazing photographer. Um, and he was able to travel down to Arkansas with us and be with us on the first day of netting, <laughs> transporting the birds north, and then releasing them. So he was there every step of the way, taking really awesome pictures. Um, so I'm going to walk you through how we captured the birds. So we had elevated mist nets. You can see them here on painter's poles. So once the nets were up, we were able to extend them to make them higher up into the canopy. We used playback <coughs> of the birds. They sound like rubber duckies. I hope you can hear that. It's the best sound ever. Um, anyway, so um, we used playback uh, to entice the birds to come to the net and figure out what was going on. We had little decoys. I bought little wood wooden hand carvings. Um, of red-breasted nuthatches and I painted the heads brown and put other paint on them to make them look like brown-headed nuthatches. And so we got these really cool pictures. We also got good pictures of my <clears throat> crazy terrified face um, when after two and a half years we were finally there <laughs> trying to capture the birds and I was freaking out. But it's okay. It's still an okay picture. This is Rich. Hi, Rich. Um, and he was there with us to help us trap birds because he had experience with that from his master. So it was kind of cool. He's Rich is a postdoc now at the University of Missouri with Tom Bono. Um, so it was cool that he's back in Missouri and was able to help us with um, the first days of netting. So then once we capture the birds, if we captured any birds, we would take them out of the net um, and put them in these transport tubes, which are just four inch cardboard mailing tubes. Um, we spared no expense that were ventilated. Um, we just drilled holes in the sides. We put a quarter inch dowel at the bottom for a perch and put tool with a rubber band on the top and then covered them up so they would stay quiet. Um, some of them didn't stay on the perch. As you can see, some of them were just stuck up on the top. <clears throat> they weren't stuck, they chose to be up there um, for the record. Um, this is one of my nuthatch wood carvings that I think I just forgot to take off the slide. And then we took them to a small uh, aircraft, we have an MDC aircraft, and we were able to fly them. The reason we used the aircraft is because it cut down on transport time by like four hours. So if we'd driven the birds, it would have taken about seven hours um, without many stops. And with the plane, it took about an hour. So um, with driving time, it really cut that time um, in half. Um, by more than half. So this is Knopp on the left, our awesome photographer, and he was there with us on our first day. Um, Frank is in the front, our awesome pilot, Mark, and then I have a crate of the birds you can see covered up right here on my lap. This is one of the birds in the tubes um, through the tool on the top, and um, this is a video of them while they were on the plane. So I kind of 
we were monitoring them very closely on the first day because I just wanted to know how they would respond or if they were acting stressed. We threw mealworms in there. You can see down here, um, we threw some mealworms in there that they could eat. Some of them ate them all. Some of them didn't really touch them. So lots of variation there. But yeah, they seem to do just fine. This is Mark. He's our pilot. He's the best. We were in a very small aircraft, as you can tell. Yes, four of us fit in there <laughs> with all of our stuff. <laughs> it was crazy. And then it was really neat to um, bring the birds to the release sites. And we had a parking spot and a short walk to the release sites. We put up a few tents to be in the shade. And oh, it was just so awesome to see all of our conservation partners like meeting us along the way with their cameras and taking video of us carrying in a crate. You know, you couldn't even see the birds yet. People were just so excited. Um, just some really great partners. Mark Twain National Forest folks were there. Jody Eberly, who is retired with the Forest Service, she started a lot of this pine woodland management um, 30 years ago. She kind of took a risk and was kind of put herself out there that they noticed that the management was looked great on some of these pines and areas that they burned. So she wanted to increase that acreage. And um, I don't think it was an easy road for her and um, for in the beginning. And so she kind of started all that and so she was able to be there at the release. We had everybody wear masks and try to be as, as cautious as possible uh, in COVID times. Um, so we kept it to a very minimal crew. Um, I wanted to make a big to-do and have media there and have a bunch of people there, but it just wasn't feasible. Uh, or safe in the time of COVID, but it was really cool to walk up and have everybody be excited to, to take pictures and, and see the birds after all that time, especially for managers. Okay, so then we processed the birds, which means we gave each of them a unique color band combination. You can see color band on one leg and a silver um, federal band on the other leg. Um, this is Kristen Heath. She was kind of my partner in crime. We were, we've been in the field together this whole time. Um, we helped hire her with the university um, to help us with the reintroduction and then monitoring afterwards and then with the spring nest monitoring and things like that. So um, that's been really fun. So we banded them, took lots of selfies, um, and then we, we attached radio tags to half of them. So these radio tags are low tech nano tags. They're 0.29 grams and they last about a month. Um, so they're very, very tiny. Uh, we attach them with an elastic, you can see the elastic right here, with a little harness that goes up and over around their legs, um, not too tight so it doesn't chafe them. Um, <clears throat> it was hard to work on birds that tiny, but Kristen and I acted like each other's hands. It was crazy. She would hold it and I would like help put the elastic around the leg and we just worked super well together and we were able to process, put that radio on in less than a minute. So that was very exciting. They're just the coolest birds. Look at that big old wedge on its face to excavate. They're just really, they're just so beautiful. We also put up about 25 roost boxes that we built from short leaf pine logs. Uh, a few of them that we cut at Basket, a research area outside of Columbia with permission. Uh, but we created about, well, Frank built them and they're about half um, pine logs with a cavity in the middle. These are roost boxes, not for nesting. They could use them for nesting, but we put them up so that they'd have um, they wouldn't have to excavate their own roost before the temperatures got chilly. And then we have another set of uh, just like the man-made box rather than just a pine log. <coughs> and this is Frank and me and Kristen. And then, um, you know, we got through three mornings of trapping. Um, in three mornings of trapping, we got 25 birds. So we were, got real cocky. We were like on a roll and we were doing really well. And then Hurricane Laura weather shut us down because it came right up through the middle of the U.S. through Arkansas and the Ozarks. So that shut us down for about <clears throat> a week and a half or two weeks, but it gave us time to track the birds that we had just tagged. So um, lots of tracking in rain, but not lightning. Don't worry. Um, and so lots of tracking, driving around, Kristen standing in the back of a truck, me driving slowly and just scanning looking for the birds. Um, it's just been really fun. Another beautiful photo by Knopp. We took these just some really amazing pictures down um, where the birds are and used a little playback and was just able to get really close up, really amazing shots. He's just such an amazing photographer. Um, I'm just really excited for people to go down and see this habitat. This pine woodland is just so gorgeous and it's only in this part of the state and it's it's pretty far away. It's it's south of Highway 60 um, and it's pretty far away, but it's so worth the drive. It's just such a kind of cool, unique system. It's not unique to our state, but it's just, there's not a ton of it in the state. So 
so it's only in that part of the world so it's just really neat i encourage you guys to go look for these birds so again so many partners I'm, i've been continually blown away by partner support and excitement over this project just everybody's so pumped um the forest service washita national forest staff was just incredible. So we went down those first three days, trap birds, and then we took two other very short trips, just two day netting trips at a time, um, where we had this insane schedule where we'd go down Tuesday uh, late morning, fly down and set up nets, spend the night, wake up, trap birds, take them to the airport, fly north, drive them to the release sites, process them, go back to the airport, fly back south, set up nets till dark, and then net another morning and come back up. And so through those two additional efforts, we were able to uh, wrap up this year's effort. But the Washington National Forest staff were down there, they would scout birds while we were in transit, really saved us a ton of time. They were always there every morning to give us staff to help us take up put up and take down nets. It was just awesome. And then Tall Timbers Research Station, the folks I've talked about in Florida, um, we they drove up to help us on those initial first week of trapping that we were going to do to help us along. So they really helped with those initial 25 birds plus Jim on the left here, just a great resource for learning more about the birds. He's worked with these birds for over 12 years. And so we really tried to do all of our research we could of anyone who'd worked with these birds for a long, long time. And he's, his help was really invaluable, but just everybody's been so excited to help. There's another awesome photo by Knopp. Um, just great. And so our 2020 summary is that we met, we got 46 of our 50 bird goal for this year. Um, released in the Mark Twain National Forest from August 25th to September 25th. So it took us a little while in there, but it gave us good weeks to track when we couldn't get down and, and grab birds. Um, 24 of the birds were fitted with radio transmitters. About half of those have died so far because they only last about a month. And I think we have seven or eight or nine tags still active and heading down tomorrow early um, to track the rest of those before they die probably this week or next. So finding the squeakers, where do I go, Sarah, if I want to see nuthatches? So the release site is between Winona and Van Buren South on Highway J. You can email me if you want, if you want more details. I can tell you generally where to go. Please do not use playback to elicit a response from the birds. It's just added stress because they think another bird's there and they get all agitated. And you know, after the big move that they've made, we just don't want to add any extra stress. But I can give you leads on where to stand and where to go. And if you hang out for 20, 30 minutes, maybe not even that, um, of silence in the same spot, you'll hear or see them. They're, they're, they're pretty vocal and when one starts, normally they're communicating to each other a lot and they're just moving around um, and you will hopefully get to see a few. If you're a photographer and you have really good camera equipment, they hang out up in the canopy so they're up pretty high. Um, so sometimes they can be kind of tough to get eyes on um, but if you're a photographer and you have a major zoom lens, you can try to document color bands and it will help with our sort of tracking of their survival. So this is just an example. So Lisa Saffel, Lisa, I saw you on the webinar. Hi, I hope I'm saying your last name correctly, but she took some awesome pictures uh, and sent them to me. Because uh, I said, oh, I heard you guys saw nuthatches. Do you have any photos where we can confirm the color bands? And so while these photos look far away, when you zoom in, you can see that this is yellow, blue, and then the other leg would just have the one silver band on it. So we were able to, I was able to ask Lisa where she was standing when she got this. Um, and so that helps. That's another point uh, in our tracking efforts. And then this other bird that just looks like a bird's rump up in the tree that's red green. You can see red green on the left leg and then silver on the other leg. So um, if you only get a photo of one leg with color bands on it, that will work. That's the ID we need because the leg with the silver federal band only has that silver federal band on it. We didn't put a color band with the silver band because their tarsi are too short. So the color banded leg is the real ID. So for example, Here's three examples. So if you just get a picture of one leg with the color bands on it, if you can see both bands, sometimes there's just one band, um, that's good enough for us. Put a pin in Google Maps on your phone wherever you're standing and email me and you can help add to the survival monitoring of our birds. Okay, so another plug for woodlands. They're just so great for wildlife and I love talking to our managers about this. There's so much good woodland restoration that's occurring in the state. Um, through M MDC and Mark Twain National Forest and state parks and lots of different management entities are doing woodland restoration. It's great. Um, it's just a more diverse system. Um, you know, 
it, it helps provide nesting substrate for ground nesters, shrub nesters, mid canopy, and canopy nesters. So it's just a richer environment with more of those um, nesting layers. Um, it also helps game species like deer and turkey and bobwhite. So it helps with that side of the argument um, if, you know, it doesn't take away from any of our more traditional outdoor uses. Um, but also it's great for birding. You know, multiple studies in Missouri led by Frank Thompson and others in the Midwest on both pine and oak woodlands show that a broader suite of declining species benefit from woodland management than those to which it is not beneficial. So this, these pictures of these species on the right, these are all species outlined in our Missouri Bird Conservation Plan, which outlines our most threatened species um, that nest in woodland. So it helps a lot of different species, not just these that are in decline. Um, but as far as birding goes, I'm really excited for yeah, the reintro to draw birders to this region. So as I said, like the shortleaf pine woodland is just so beautiful. Birding and bird watching and wildlife watching are growing in popularity and birding is an economic driver. Um, I'm just really hopeful that you all, more birders, Missourians will experience and learn about uh, these pine woodland systems and spend time uh, and money in this beautiful part of the state. Um, it's just a really, really beautiful place. My heart's kind of in the Ozarks because I did my master's work there. So I like it a lot. <laughs> And so, so throughout our 80 year history, MDC has worked to restore extirpated or near extirpated species in the state, both game species like wild uh, white tailed deer and turkey, but also Topeka shiners and federally endangered American bearing beetles. So thanks to the habitat restoration on the Mark Twain National Forest and managers in this area and strong conservation partnerships that we're so lucky to have in our state and between states with Arkansas, um, amongst agencies, NGOs, universities, um, great folks like MRBO, were able to restore one more piece of this pine woodland ecosystem that was largely removed by human hands. So it's kind of an exciting story. So thank you everyone. I will, oh, I took 44 minutes. It's a lot longer than I thought. And so um, I'll leave you with one of these um, slow-mo videos of releasing of one of our birds. It's kind of awesome. And anyway, I, um, I appreciate the opportunity time uh, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Sarah. That was wonderful. <laughs> that was a lot of background that I certainly didn't know um, from it's our perspective. <laughs> no, no, no. I just, that was, that was really like a well-rounded um, background and how the reintroduction actually proceeded in in modern times because from our perspective honestly it was always kind of talked about but then sarah became state ornithologist and magically it just happened so magic, it, was magic. <laughs> it seems like it took a ton of work yeah. um we do have some questions for you right um let's see here Sorry, so, it got kind of dark in here. I couldn't see my face when I was presenting and <laughs> it just got darker and darker. We could see you. Okay. Um, it looks like Linda Williams had a question about the trackers, but then you answered it a okay. little bit later. Hey, Linda. Um, so Kathy Sue says, if the radio monitor only lasts, lasts a nope. month, what happens after that? Basically. Yeah, that's a great question. I forgot to answer. Yeah, so we're going to be doing, we're going to try and get um, locations. We'll be doing monitoring once a month throughout the year. Um, uh, so we'll go down there. It'll probably be um, a, a playback survey that we'll use um, to elicit a response, but it's trying to get reciting of those color bands. And so, um, well, yeah, we'll just continue to monitor the birds that we can get eyes on in suitable habitat and in chunks of the habitat where we have seen the birds move around in that first month. That's really giving us a lot of clues about where they may eventually settle. Um, but some of these birds have been all over the place. Like they'll be gone for a few days and they're just off the grid where we are searching with our antennas and then they'll be back after a few days. So they're certainly exploring. They're actively foraging. They're setting up little social groups. Some birds are loners, but not many. Most are with like one or two or three other birds just moving around foraging. Um, and so they're setting up social groups. They're exploring the available habitat and that's exactly kind of what we expected um, to see. So we'll continue to monitor them monthly and then we'll monitor nest success the following spring. And then we'll be bringing more birds after next summer. A sort of related question that also has to do with the radio tags. Um, yeah. What happens to the transmitters 
are there any data that birds can get caught up on branches by them? So yeah, so it's it's kind of a fine line when you're putting that elastic harness on. The harness is is underneath their feathers, so it doesn't like it's not loose and floppy. And if it is, they get out of it. And so it's like a fine line where you put it around the leg, like close to the skin, but you're not pulling the elastic. So the elastic isn't stretched. It's just kind of sitting there. Um, we did have one dropped tag because we made the harness too loose, um, which I would rather it be that than tight. Um, but yeah, the birds still move freely and fly and no, it shouldn't get hung up on stuff, but it always, I guess, could. There's always some risk involved in putting anything on a bird, um, but it's relatively low and it's under their feathers. So it's, it's not like hanging out there to get caught on anything. Um, in theory, um, the, the tags will fall off eventually, but we may try to capture some of our birds in the spring and try to take off those transmitters because that elastic won't break down after just a year. It may take a little bit longer than that. Here's a question from Eric. Are you releasing all of the nut hatches from the same site and how did you select the specific release site since they are short distance dispersers? Are you worried about competition at all? So more than competition, serious. we just wanted them to know there were other birds there since they're the only ones in the state. And so we did choose just one release site for all 50 birds so that we knew that some birds would still be hanging out in the general location and that they would hear others to socialize with because socialization was a big part of it. And in our talkings with Jim Cox at Tall Timbers Research Station, he had so much experience with nuthatches that we cross-referenced and asked a lot of these questions to confirm that our hunches or what we thought we wanted to do felt right to him as well. And he said, yeah, he, we, would, we should release all in the same place so they know that there are other birds there to socialize with. They're not out in the open. We could have probably moved around a little bit. We were releasing them in, a, in an area where it was there's habitat all around the release site, but it was in a big contiguous block that kind of wrapped around um, a really large area. But there are some chunks here and there that they've roved out to. I mean, they would have found each other, I think, either way, but it just made us feel better to know that the probability of them finding other birds um, was greater at one location. We have two similar questions from two awesome people, um, Lisa and Susan, and they are both asking about uh, the possibility of a red cockaded woodpecker reintroduction um, in our in our state. And Lisa further asked, do we have any longleaf pine in Missouri? So. We don't have longleaf pine, um, only shortleaf pine. It's our only native pine in the state. Um, no, we're not we're not planning on red cockaded woodpecker restoration. That is what people what many people think when we talk about brown headed nut hatch restoration. That is just a stepping stone to RCWs, which red cockaded woodpeckers. Sorry. Um, but we, our trees just aren't mature enough and we don't have the mad, like the major expanses of pine woodland yet that, that these species would need. So maybe 10 or 20 years down the line, we can start to look at that, but no, we don't have any plans to bring back our CWs right now. Um, so Ethan and I, kind of answered this a little bit in the um, Q&A by, by typing it in, but we did want to bring it up to you as well. Can you talk a little bit more about why cavity nesters tend to breed earlier, as you mentioned towards the beginning? Well, you guys, I'm sure, have insight on this as well, but um, it's easier to stay warmer in a cavity than it is in an open cup. You're not exposed as strongly to weather events and uh, rain and cold snaps and frost. And so, um, yeah, I think that they've just adapted to, because they're in a confined space, that they can just stay warmer and they're just out of the elements more. And so they can just start a little earlier and probably just adapted over a very long time because they have, you know, less competition before a lot of the migrants even have come back. So, um, so that I'm sure you guys have insight as well, Dana. Yeah, uh, we were thinking that certainly about the sheltered nature of a cavity in and of itself. I was also thinking that um, the cavity nesters that come to my mind typically aren't migrants at all, or they're very short distance oh, migrants. Yes, that's right. So they don't, right? They don't have to go. I'm, I'm probably yes. not thinking of a couple, but they probably they don't have to go through that time consuming and risky. Mic they're already where they're going to be, so they can. That's true. That's true. Yeah, that's certainly it as well. Yeah, most of them are residents, so they're here all winter as well. I wonder too if predation is lower that early in the season because 
potentially snakes and some other predators may not be as active when it's still pretty chilly. But a lot of that we don't know for sure. We don't have like sentinel studies that tell us for sure because a lot of migrants and just there's so many things influencing what makes a bird nest <laughs> successful or fail. There's just so yeah. many factors that we probably, some we haven't even ever considered. Um, but that's the cool part about birds is that we'll never know everything. And I'm okay with that personally because there will always be something to study. <laughs> I don't think this we're ever going to even know everything about one species. Sorry, no. go ahead, this is a really interesting conversation and from a biological perspective. So, you know, I, I think a purple martin's coming back as migrants, whether they're migrants or residents. So what, what do you think, uh, well, nut hatches, I don't know about their incubation period and then how long the nesting cycle is. So is it longer like it is with other cavity nesters? So it's still kind of another exposure factor? I'm not sure. I think it's about two or three weeks, um, like most others. Um, but, but yeah, I. We just I'm going to Google it. I'll Google it. <laughs> I'll Google it. <laughs> we have a related question as well. Katie asks, do they have multiple broods? No, no, not to my knowledge. No. I feel bad that I don't know that offhand right away, but. Um, you will, I bet. <laughs> yeah, I have to feel like I'm going to get schooled in all things nut hatch breeding very soon. Um, but uh, I don't believe so, but I'd have to look it up to confirm. Let's see. We have, I don't see, well, we, we there's chats popping up and questions, <laughs> Q&A popping up, but a lot of people are, are saying congratulations and, and a successful reintroduction. Well, thanks. I appreciate everybody caring enough to sign on and um, and to listen. Um, it's so nice to see so many names that I recognize on the list. So, um, yeah, no, it's been really, it's been a really fun project with really great people. Like, I really can't tell you, I know I just keep saying it, but just the partnerships have just been overwhelming. I saw Kristen on here. Hi, Kristen. She's, um, she and I, like, have just worked on this since we since it started and she and Frank and I have especially have gone on some of these trips where there's like 16 17 hour days and we've talked about this where it's just like all of us are just like we got to get it done we got to get it done and we all are just so happy to be working on this and excited that it's like it's not even work so I've just been so humbled by just people's willingness to jump in and it's just been so fun. <laughs> it's been the funnest thing I've worked on so far and I'd say a lot because it's a freaking awesome job. <laughs> so I to work on a lot of cool stuff. It's just been so fun. Hey, I, three more questions came in. Okay. And they're all, they're pretty different. So uh, one is from Lisa. Do they roost socially as groups? They roost in cavities yes. together? So they, they will roost together, I believe, just in family groups. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if people have, because to determine that, whether it's just family groups or outside, you'd have to bleed them and do genetic work. Um, and I just don't know. I wonder if Rich knows anything about that, if he could type into the chat, if he knows anything about that. And whether they're double brooded too, he may know that as well, if he's willing to comment on that. But I, they do roost as family groups. Um, but I'm not sure about outside of that or if anybody knows. Um, breasted knot hatches compete or do they use a different habitat? They, they'll use hardwoods uh, to forage in like oaks and hickories more so than pines and so really in my study of it in my research uh, really the only potential competitor would be pine warblers in the breeding season because they also forage on the cone in particular so they're foraging on the cones that's why they hang out up in the canopy so much they're foraging on cones, they're eating the seeds and insects on the cones. So they're way high up in the canopy. And um, I've seen them actually, I've seen them fly at and red-breasted nuthatches fly at them down there this fall, um, tracking them, not crazy, like, it, like it's a real source of competition, I don't believe, but we'll continue to monitor behavior and interactions like that. But, um, but no, I don't believe that they'll compete with white-breasted in particular, because I think they're just foraging in different places. Um, how did you settle on 50 birds? So Kathy Sue says, I guess finding 50 was probably hard, but was that the driver? 
for that number? No, that was not the driver. So we, we talked to the folks who did previous reintroductions about a potential number that may be good to start out and about 80 to 100 was our goal based on their input um, of a, you know, a sustainable breeding population. And so we just kind of cut that in half to do over two years rather than try to get 100 birds in one year because that would, I believe, be hard if, unless we had a lot bigger team of people trapping like nonstop over weeks and weeks. Um, we, so we settled on 50 just to kind of cut that number in half. It was not that hard to find 50. You know, if, if Hurricane Laura hadn't shut us down and we'd trapped continuously every day, we had 25 after three mornings of trapping. And that was with about five or six, well, just four or five trap teams going out and setting up a few nets each, each person. So we had about, I don't know, our average per net was probably one to two birds. And so if we put up that many birds, we'd on average get, um, yeah, one to two per net ish. Um, and so I don't think, I don't think it would have been too hard to find 50 if we could have just been able to continuously net. But really, I mean, we did it all in seven mornings um, because that's really all the time we had. We had those first three days and then two more trips with just two more mornings with um, us going down to Arkansas on short trips. So it was really all done in seven mornings. So if you have more people and um, more time, it, it would probably go a lot faster. We're hoping for it to go faster next year. Um, Katie asks, are cowbirds ever an issue? No, they're not an issue because they can't get in the hole. So even, even um, you know, I said that they're second at, like secondary cavity nesters will use the cavities and they can if they fit in the hole. So they use a very tiny hole. I don't remember offhand exactly the, the width, but it's even smaller than like a bluebird box um, cavity hole. And so um, really, I think chickadees and potentially titmice are the only species that small that can use um, a cavity they've used. Of course, larger birds can like excavate around to make the hole big enough to get in, but um, but no, cowbirds um, shouldn't be able to get in there. So I have a question that I probably should know the answer to, but it surprised me when you said that they excavated their own cavities. Yeah. Do white-breasted do that? I didn't think so. I don't think so, no. And they need really punky snags. So punky is an actual term, just really well decayed um, uh, pine snags. And so Rich had a way, went so okay. did his master's work down in the Washita National Forest where we um, got birds. He monitored nest survival and he was able to um, put tags on them to look at their home range size and resource use and things like that and monitor them more intensively than we're monitoring them for survival. Um, and so he had this little tester where you could poke it into the bark and figure out how punky it was and how decayed the pine snag was. And so they need relatively decayed pine mm, snag to mm. excavate. It's not like a woodpecker. They're not as strong as that, but they are able to excavate a cavity. Let's see. What else you got? These are great. I've got a couple more questions. Um, okay. Eric says, fun question. What other birds get got in the mist nets and were any other birds attracted to the brown-headed nuthatch playback? So you, so I think we caught a chickadee and that's it. So really the playback we used was a mix of um, what Jim believes are male female vocalizations. So Jim at Tall Timbers Research Station, I only say believes to be different. He, they've tested it and they believe that um, they can tell the sexes apart. They're monomorphic by plumage, so you can't tell the difference just by looking at whether it's a male or female. Um, but, and he has a paper um, that they're getting ready to publish that shows the difference in vocalization between male and female. Hmm. He put together that they use for their tracking a mix of what they feel are male and female um, vocalizations and it was like a three minute loop and we'd play that. So it didn't have, it had like a crow in the background, but it didn't have too many other like scolding species in the background. Uh, but yeah, you'd hear like uh, crows kind of get agitated or blue jays if they were close enough to hear the playback um, and sometimes chickadees. It's really interesting though, Kristen and I have chatted about this where if you do playback, when we've done playback for nuthatches in Missouri, trying to get reciting um, and tracking the tags and get locations in a tree, when we play their squeaks, um, other birds don't respond because they're not used to the species. <laughs> and then down in, the, mm. or down in Arkansas, when you play it, they would get kind of agitated and start looking around just because they're used to it. So um, anyway, so it's, we, didn't, we didn't catch too many non-target species, no. 
So Paige has put in the chat all about birds.org says they sometimes enlarge these holes, but rarely excavate them entirely on their own as red breasted nut hatches often do. And I believe she's saying that white breasted nut hatches do not only very rarely excavate them, excavate cavities entirely on their own, but red headed, red, excuse me, red breasted nut hatches often do. Thanks, nice. Paige. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, Another kind of related question, um, Marsha asks, do they only use pine snags? They, no, they, they have been found to use a hardwood snag, I think, but it's just, it's not the norm. It's, it's not in the majority at all. So yes, I think they prefer a pine snag, but they have found nest cavities in hardwoods, like well-decayed snags. But yeah, it's mostly pine. And Katie asks, is there any interest in eventually researching male, 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 female and female, female vocalizations and their interactions? Yeah, potentially. I mean, that's the cool thing about this is that we have this kind of isolated population that we can do, we could do a lot of really cool research on. And so Jim has done some cool projects. Um, Jim's done some cool projects on sex ratio. So because because they're cooperative breeders, it's mostly males that hang around. Uh, so it's usually a male dominated sex ratio. And he, on one of the reintroductions, I believe they did in Florida, they reintroduced a, a very small group of only females and only male young to see how, how those interactions are, are working out. And so I haven't heard what the what the findings are from that, but it's just really interesting. So we got sex ratio information back from feather sexing uh, when we, uh, when we process the birds and it's relatively even it's about 27 males to 18 females i think there's like one pending or something like that where they're still trying to figure it out but so that we were very excited about that so that's pretty even and we didn't know whether we would have you know it skewed biased male or not and so yeah it's really heartening that hopefully we have hopefully we have lots of nesting activity in the spring so but yes there's lots of opportunities katie for for lots of different research like that. And um, really it would require, we, we, when we netted the birds in Arkansas, we tried to have people pay attention um, to what vocalizations they were making when they came into the net. And if they made one of the, one or the other vocalization to mark it mm -hmm. on the tube, had people mm -hmm. write information on the cardboard tube. Um, and so we tried to validate some of that and we had some that were, that were right and some that were not. And, um, and so just have to see. So I don't know if you even saw it or not there, Sarah, but Betsy asked, so you, do you have an idea of how many males or females you moved? The answer yes. is now yes. Yes. Yeah, we do. Um, I'm not sure it'll, how it'll factor into measuring nest success, though. I mean, we'll just have to see. We'll have to see what the pairing mm -hmm. uh, is like and how many nest cavities exist and that we can find. I mean, these birds won't be tags. Clearly, the tags run out around now. Um, and so we're talking months down the line um, where we're hoping that we'll get an idea of where birds are starting to set up territories. You know, now we're following them around the available habitat. Some of them are staying in generally the same area, but we don't know if, you know, we'll have to validate whether they're with a, whether it's a male female pair or whether they'll even stay in that location. You know, it kind of didn't for us to look at home range or use of habitat in particular with the tags on because they've never been here before. And so they're doing so much exploration that they don't have a home range yet. And so we weren't really able to monitor that. But once nest success, um, once we start finding nests, we'll be able to hopefully get a lot more insight into that. Let's see. Case is so much potential. <laughs> yeah, there really is. Um, I'm not going to let Sarah off the hook yet. I have one more question. Okay. We um, got what do you know about um, maybe there's different range wide? I don't know. Maybe we could have a new subspecies in Missouri eventually. I don't know. But what is across their range their general nesting success? I know cavity nesters usually do better than open cup nesters. I knew you're gonna ask some technical question. <laughs> I, I gotta have a gotcha. <laughs> you always have a gotcha. No, I'm not sure offhand. Rich would probably have insight on that if he's still on. 
See? Well, this this we can say, Sarah, we can say nesting success in the Missouri Ogar, Ozarks is going to be better than it's been in like over 100 years. Well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> well, successful compared to previous years, that's for sure. But no, I'd have to look that up. Sorry. Oh, Eric asked what my favorite bird in the Ozarks is. It's a peewee, of course. I'm not giving up on my peewees yet. Um, why is it the brown head? Not, if it ever changes to the brown head, <laughs> look at them. They're they're awesome. They say squeaka squeaka, and they're beautiful. I don't know. They're just really charismatic. I love them. What else? Anything else? It's really someone. Who's I think part of their charisma stems from cuteness plus the the very social nature and cooperative nature i mean that's just an endearing quality i mean they're helpers who, who doesn't like a helper <laughs> that looks like it for questions my friend okay well thanks again so, it was really fun to kind of talk about it a whole lot more than like a 12 minute presentation i've given previously so it was really fun all right Thank you so much, Sarah. This was really, I've learned so much and really enjoyed it and really appreciate yeah. your time. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Keep, keep doing great work. Thanks, friend. All right, good night, everybody.